Welcome in the Your Turn podcast. I'm your host, Cedric, and in this podcast, I speak with people and talk about their pivots in life, in career, and in health. We talk about the gut feel they had, about the systems they used, and the learnings. Today, I talk with Michael Humble. Michael Humble is the founder of Chaomatic, he's the author of Nobody Knows You, and he's a sales expert. And the last couple of years, he has helped hundreds of companies with building their business. And today we're going to talk about how he is building his business. We dig deep into why he moved from being an employee to being an entrepreneur. We talk about scaling issues that he has and had. We talk about most mistakes that most startups have. And we talk about his upcoming book. And of course, there's so much more that you will hear about in this podcast. I learned a lot with Michael. Michael has been very open and transparent in in his challenges and how he built his business. I learned a lot and I'm sure you will too. Enjoy this episode. Hello, Michael Humble. Welcome to the Your Turn podcast, where we talk about your pivots, about your challenges and your successes. Thank you. I'm very curious about your question because nobody has ever asked me those. Uh, that's why it's going to be something completely different. And um, uh, a lot of people know you, um, but not that, a lot of people on, know about the story behind you. Mm-hmm. Hang on. World famous in Belgium. World famous in Belgium eh? and, and uh, around it as well. All right. So great. So um, uh, let's talk about briefly about your uh, current situation. Uh, who are you? What you're doing? So in a very, in a nutshell, uh, 24. 22 years of a sales career, uh, from sales to vice president of sales, chief revenue officer, head of global sales, all the nice titles, you know, that it's perfect on a, on a, on a cart and you give it in the bar, people are impressed, but at home, I still have nothing to say, you know, that kind of stuff. So I did all the titles at lots and lots of sales working for me. And then at a certain stage, because I was traveling so much, I said it's about four years ago, I said, I don't want to do this. I'm just going to take a sabbatical. And after one week. I'm not the guy to sit at home. I said, you know what? Let me give something back to the world. Let me teach startups. And I, I never encountered startups. I had no clue what it was. So I basically went to startups, started helping them. And I very quickly got hired by investors that said, hey, Michael, I'm going to put some money in scale-ups. I want you to come along to fix sales and marketing. And that very quickly uh, led to two things. One, I, I, I realized that they didn't know me. So I had to prove a lot of the stuff that I found normal when, when you're a VP of sales, you have all these people around you that help you. I was alone. I had to do all of this. So I suddenly became a consulting and never had sold consulting in my life. So it was weird to talk about money because the bad thing is if you sell yourself, you have a tendency to want to win. So you're afraid of asking bigger amounts. Right? So if, if, if I had to sell you, Cedric, I would probably charge double than what you dare to ask. And it's something very weird. I never experienced this. I'm, sh- I'm sure we can work something out. Sorry? I'm sure we can work something out <laughs> that way. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's a good trick. Huh? Actually, if, if, if you have a company, typically, and you want to access the CEO or one of the founders, typically for a keynote, somebody else needs to tell the price. And it becomes, it's a very good sales technique. Yeah? You've got to put a level in between and you can actually charge more. So hang on. Back to the story. So... Um, I had to build a personal brand because they didn't know. And I said, you know, LinkedIn and YouTube, let me show you how this works. So I started filming myself, explaining stuff about sales, started scaling LinkedIn. And that very quickly started, like I made a YouTube show. uh, I went to stages. My goal was one stage per month. I kind of kept it up uh, until now. It's a, if you're a founder of a company, just make sure one of you guys is on stage once a month, because if there's 50 people, that's a thousand phone calls. You don't need to do right to get there. And then that kind of completely went out of hand. So the YouTube started growing, LinkedIn started expanding. I then wrote a book called nobody knows you, which talks about if you're a, you have a product or service, or you want to build a personal brand, or you want to scale your company, you got to fix it. Nobody knows you that then lets people reading the book, telling me, Hey, Michael, can you please, uh, outside of sales consulting, can you please uh, come and do this for me? So then I build an agency called Chaomatic. And what we do there is we, we do, um, we build B2B content. So in one day of filming, we can actually produce eight to nine months of content. So we actually, it's the ultimate, the ultimate offer. It's like a shortcut in time. We help you on time. 
right? So that's where we currently are. The agency is growing fast. The consulting is still there. I'm kind of pivoting again on the on the consulting. My original dream was to build like a um, a strategic sales consulting. You don't see them a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I bumped into another company, and they they were so good that I thought I'm not like those people, right? This is not me. I'm not going to do that. But still, I get so many questions for training, and you can't. The problem with if you're if you're alone at a certain stage. You can't do it all. It's just too much. So what I'm doing now is I focus 80% of my time on the uh, Chaometic, so the, the B2B content agency. And 20% I do, I do still do training and coaching, but it's always on scale. So it's always large classrooms. I try to avoid a bit the individual because it, it, I might go back if I see something really interesting. I sometimes do it, but otherwise, you, I mean, you only have a, a, a amount of time. By the way. I'm starting to write a new book. I have to present it on 6th December on a stage. And honestly, I haven't written a single letter yet. So <laughs> I'm getting really nervous. I'm going to start. But I need pressure. If I don't have the pressure, it's not going to work, right? Well, my book took 15 months to write. So maybe that's the other extreme. But uh, yeah. six months is, uh, is getting there yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Last time I did so, it in two months and a half. <laughs> well, good luck. Everybody was... But you, Rhythm, huh? Yeah, Rhythm. and, and yeah, yeah. This is my next challenge when I write uh, an next book. Um, how to uh, make it also in a in, in two three months? And yeah. because there is a technique also around this, right? Yeah. The the thing I didn't like. So one of the things I learned. And if you ever want to write a book to other people listening to this, is the first thing you're, you're thinking. I was thinking way too much of like the content table and structure and. And actually, uh, I got some help. Somebody said, no, 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 you got to do this stream. Michael, you just, uh, for me, I'm an early morning person. So I wake up at seven and then I have two or three hours, really good hours. And what I do is I write volume. I just write, wow, volume, 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 volume. And then I do a big cleanup. And then I start structuring. I, I work actually reversed. And I've seen that that works really well. So now I know the next weeks is just a volume thing. Then I need to add structure and, and the title comes. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it, it's, it's, what I hated is the, you've got to reread it again and again. And um, oh, yeah. I really didn't because. like that part. <laughs> and every time you read, you find errors. Yeah. You, <laughs> or you optimization. So when do you stop? Yeah. Yeah. You have to let go at a certain stage. And uh, still, yeah. still now, uh, I, I, yeah, one day I was in a book, book club. This is really funny. I was in a book club and they're asking questions. Lots of people in there. And suddenly this guy comes and says, hey, Michael, on page 72, you've written uh, something about that. What's your opinion? And I really had to say, like, hey, can you can you please say what's on page 72? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah of course. And um, what was it? Can you tell us? It was about structure in... Uh, you see, I still remember it was about structure in... You know, typically when you do deals, sometimes you... I mean, in many cases that you know they need it, you know they want it, they have everything, and yet the deal doesn't happen. So the interesting part is the way to fix that, and that's a question I get like every every week a few times, there are a few things to do. One of the key things to do is to show something I call the, so there are two things. One is the why now, why should I have it now, right? That's yeah. obvious. And the two is the structure slide. Is, is what we need to do is we need to paint a world that's complex and sophisticated and then say, we have a simple solution. So by the end of your speech, you always have to go back to this simplification where you say, in, in our process, our proven methodology, blah, 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 in three steps, in five steps, this is how it looks. And this creates peace of mind because a lot of CEOs and executives, when they look at whatever you do, they go like, hang on, this is going to be a lot of work because I have to ask all these people. They don't want to do that. So what you got to do is the last piece of friction. It's a last mile, whatever you want to call it. You gotta take it away saying, no, 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 no. We got you covered. This is how we've mm -hmm. done it many multiple times. Especially you, as Cedric, when you're running your consultancy agency, don't forget to add that. Because if I would be a leader, a sales leader, and you would come to me and say, I can do this and this, this for you, I would be very worried because the first thing I would think, it's gonna take a lot of time of not selling for my guys. So you, you gotta cover that base. And I see many, many people uh, are forgetting that. By the way, when I'm telling you now, this type of topic, this is going to be in a new book. It's all going to be, I call it sales design. How do you, a lot of companies make mistakes and even big ones, especially the big ones. 
Because typically the big ones, you know what they do? They come in and they say, hey, we have a thousand offices with 10,000 people. We are yeah, the biggest, the best. Yeah. And everybody thinks like, oh, boring, but we're going to be nice because they're, we might need them one day, right? And I think yeah, exactly. sales is changing fundamentally on, on that part. So I'm very curious to see what's going to happen in the next months, especially with some of the crisis stuff. You kind of feel it coming, right? Yeah. What's going to happen there? We got a yes, little uh, yeah. Defo, defo, and you see it often, right? Oh, we are the biggest, the best, and I tend to push back. Okay, who cares? Nobody cares yeah. if we cannot help our customers. Yeah. Uh, so this, this is, uh, and also slides with hundreds of words on it, and then yeah. that's our uh, pitch deck. But so is there that also of a bit of a, So there are two things on that one because I find it intriguing. Is I used to have those decks too, and I changed it completely. There are two reasons. One is uh, because you have to. Right, and you think you've been told for 20 years that it's the, the reason. Two, uh, and kind of insecure. When I was a junior sales, I, I I was afraid I would forget to say something, which is funny because even if you forget to say something, it doesn't matter, right? The beginning is important and the end is important, or something like that that creates this emotional trigger, and all the rest you need to tell a story. And I remember it was so hard and I was like literally reading my slides. I must have been the worst thing to watch ever, right? And then you look at your, oh yeah, I forgot this fifth yeah, bullet. And then, uh, and and then the sound goes away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, true. So, so Actually, the, yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, finish it. Go ahead. And then uh, I'll say. I find what I find very an interesting journey at the stage is, so I never had sold services. So I really had to learn agencies all the I never thought about margins in agencies so that's for me a really tough journey at the moment uh, still um, I never had issues with sales I mean that always kind of flows and, and the brand grows organically it's more of like where do I aim the gun but I find it very intriguing this whole agency because I used to be I mean I was the guy launching new software new models always that but if you're suddenly on your own, I kind of got bored and I added the team, the dynamics again. Mm -hmm. And also, I have to be really honest here, is when I was a VP of sales, I could fire higher, I could make really tough decisions. But when it's suddenly your own money, oh, things become very, and you, you start becoming blind for some of the stuff because you're like, no, 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 I just don't want to spend mind processing power on this topic, right? It's uh, intriguing, very intriguing. Yeah. You say a lot of stuff. Eh? We, we've been talking a bit now about sales skills. The goal is not to talk about the systems, yeah. the pivots, and especially how you felt uh, about it. Eh? Mm -hmm. So so I'd like to backtrack again a bit in the beginning of the conversation. Eh? When you said, um, I, I traveled a lot, uh, I, I, know the, I know the feeling, right? At a certain moment, my kid was a year and a half, was sitting on the lap of... Uh, um, uh, the mother and uh, the, uh, my son asks uh, when does daddy come visiting us again and this is something that I had put in my head always so what was your moment one of the kids they asked uh, what does your dad do and he said he's a pilot <laughs> uh, 86 flights per year and my, my goal in life in the beginning was to to be, I mean, when I started, I wanted to be like a key account. I didn't even know there was like sales management. I wanted to be key account manager and I wanted to travel, see stuff. And now, after all these years, I, because I was in, uh, never home, which actually you divorces, I mean, all the stuff, right? Because you're just not there. Yeah. I feel that I'm really happy staying in the Benelux action, right? Mm -hmm. And if I do a trip abroad, it should be more fun. I mean, there can be some work related, but I do want to do it a bit not anymore you know the red eye flights at five o'clock in the morning i used to do them two three a week it's crazy if i think about it it's just it was just ridiculous but i had to do it to be at this stage if i think about it it's like it's like you want to lift weights you have to do the reps to understand to get the the muscle memory so your brain needs the same the brain the, the, the sales memory needs to be there like a lot of the stuff i just explained comes naturally like the two choices i you know all the stuff but it took me years to just get it into the system. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, yeah true. So, but when, when, when you decided to pivot, uh, you, you said then, okay, I'm going to be on a sabbatical. Uh, so, you're a bit restless. I'll answer. So, so I had this weird moment where I thought I'm never home. 
um, and I need to be back to Belgium. And then actually I joined, I got a phone call from, uh, it's so weird in life, when you start thinking well, I should do something else. I was there 12 years, right, before you leave a company. I, every year I did another role. And I said, I need, to, I need to do something else. And then a company phoned me up, which is scale up. They said, Michael, we want you to come back to Brussels, work for us. Uh, it was in big data. And we want you to build out the global uh, sales team. Uh, and we want you to raise a lot of money. So for me, coming out of a corporate world, going to a scale-up, it was an absolute shock. It took me two months to kind of recuperate because they were extremely fast. They were extremely smart. I was the oldest guy in the building, right? And then I was 40, right? So the oldest guy in the building. And they were so good with PowerPoint and all this stuff. I never had to do anything. So it was very painful. It took me two, three months. I learned a lot. And then after a year, when, when my mission was done, um, I said, I really want to do nothing for a while. And then helping these startups, this, this strange looking at it. But to be really honest, and I never told any, I was very selfish because what I wanted to do is I wanted to build a personal brand because I hoped somebody would pick me up and say, hey, Michael, why don't you come become the chief revenue officer or the CEO, you know, and that didn't happen in the three, first three, four months. And actually, after four or five months, suddenly I started getting requests. Hey, Michael, uh, we just uh, fired the CEO. Don't you want to take over a company? I mean, lots of money involved. Uh, and I wasn't making a lot of money on, on that moment. And I said, no, I'm actually having way too much fun. It was tough, but I was, it was very rewarding. I mean, you're on the journey now, Cedric, of, of filming and, and, and this creating. One of the things I always had as a sales was like, I don't have anything that I sell that you can put in the trunk of your car. So if you're selling software, you're selling air, right? I, I, I always felt guilty. You can't put my stuff in the trunk of a car. And when I started making the videos and the blogs and the, and the pictures, I felt like I'm making something. I am creating something. And I yeah. still have it up to this day. That's probably why I have an agency. It makes me so happy to, to think about a, a visual or hey, let's move this. and that. That's why I love these PowerPoints and a bit high-end PowerPoint. I just love the, 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 the art, the design of it, because you make yeah. something tangible. It's very recognizable. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 uh, people, people that sell consulting, I often call them paper consulting. For example, people that have never been in sales, but they will sell sales models. Yep. Um, but definitely right. The uh, consulting is something so strange to, to sell. Let me ask you a question. Another thing. So I had two things. I always had this feeling like I need to sell something that you can put in the trunk of your car. And the second thing was, and I'd start with the story that my first sales day ever, I got hired by a company. We were selling uh, document scanners and uh, you could also read the text of your final long time ago. And first meeting, so I put on my best suit. I had to buy a suit. I put on my best suit. I went with the, my sales manager to the meeting. Lots of old guys sitting there. I'm sitting there and they're talking about stuff I do not understand. I have no clue. It's my first day scanners. What the hell? I'm just sitting there listening and suddenly out of nowhere, the oldest guy, the CEO, turns to me and says, I want to hear the opinion of the youth. Michael, what do you think? I had no clue at all. And I basically said something very generic. I said, well, I think you only have two choices. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Like just words I had picked up. He looked at me and I'm, think I'm going through the floor. I'm thinking, oh, man. And this guy said, but Michael, that makes a lot of sense. Let's follow him. And we sold the deal. Based on, and, and I realized in that moment, I know nothing, yet they, they trust me. And since then, I've kept, and you must, that's the question for me to you. How do you deal with the imposter syndrome? Because in sales, we have to go with the, mm -hmm, yeah, sure. We kind of know everything, which we don't, right? And I see so many people dealing with this imposter syndrome. I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to post on LinkedIn because I'm not the best. Listen, you're never the best, right? You're never the best. There's always somebody smarter. So how do you deal with it? So two stories for this. So once I was in a, I was in Russia. I was um, presenting very high end graphics boards for uh, Nvidia. Eh? So uh, oh, high, cool. high end tech. Big fan. And <laughs> yeah, and I was uh, I, I was pitching to a bunch. Okay, I was presenting to a bunch of people, very uh, high end people, high tech people. And at the end of the presentation, I went uh, back to my colleagues. There were a few guys from uh, the States, uh, engineers. And the guy said, listen, 
what a lot of the things you said don't make any sense but somehow you managed to sell it and convince <laughs> everybody loves you i was like okay so that's maybe the opposite of the imposter syndrome yep. at, at the same time <laughs> exactly <laughs> at, at the same time we have quite some knowledge quite some experience and for us things are automatic yeah. and then understanding that it is not automatic or something that other people have as well to make this sellable and to make them understand okay listen um um this is our methodology this is our approach i think this is a definitely a barrier in becoming successful as an entrepreneur yeah um true yeah and yeah this and i keep seeing it back yeah. but but it's true and and the one thing i learned so because i thought you know i was when i did this switch I was around my 40s, right? Classic, probably midlife moment, thinking about uh, what what do I want? And, and the funny part is I was like 40 years, I didn't know what I want, but I didn't know what I didn't want, right? That's yeah. mostly, so a lot of people, I find it a stupid question, what do you want? Because most people don't know, right? And then I, I started this this journey, started doing, and it's funny, now now I really know what I want. I can actually make a top three, tack, 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 that's, that would be the things, but I could never do this up to four, four years ago. So I would say to the people, don't worry about it. But becoming suddenly working on your own, uh, because I also had this opinion, you know what, I'm going to be a freelancer. And then every week I can go into the city, I'm going to drink a coffee, read the newspaper, think about life, make some notes for two hours, right? With four years and a half down the drain, I have never, ever been alone to a bar, drink a coffee. <laughs> I never had time because it's, I got to do this, I got to do that. There is always something happening and something doing. And maybe I'm just not the guy to sit down and drink coffee, which is another thing also, right? But at the same time, you, you, you need to sit down to think about your business. So True. and you need yeah. to systemize your business. Yeah, that's the thing I wanted to come for, uh, to. Or I wanted to talk about one of the things that I noticed last years. Uh, I do a lot of these. Um, where one of the things I see when I enter a company is always ask them, so what, what do you guys do? And they always tell a story and I'm like, that's a bad sales story, you know? So one of the shortcuts I always do is uh, outside of LinkedIn and all of that is like, how do you tell your sales story? How do you do that? And you know what's funny? They, they, they're in a room, four people, some high tech stuff. They tell me stuff and I say, no, no, I don't need to hear the details. I just don't want you to explain the product. This is really scary. I don't need you to explain the details of the product. I, I'm just going to listen and I listen and then I say, okay, let me try sell this to you. And I always do a better job than them. It's because if you know too much detail, you become blind. And I'm blind, and you have to say, I am blind for my own business. I am, so I ask also every month, like, come in, shoot holes through this thing, tell me, uh, is this right or not? And sometimes they say stuff, and I'm like, how could I not see this? I mean, I'm teaching this to, it, it's, people are blind because they get stuck in the details, and that's normal. Exactly. Especially sometimes you say you, you, you consult people about this stuff and then you blind about the, exactly yeah. the same thing in your own organization. Yeah. It's mind blowing. Yeah. 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 And, but it, I, I, I just accepted it. It is what it is and, and yeah. deal with it, move on. And you've got to incorporate it into your strategy or into your way, way forward. Yeah. So, so you have people that are coming monthly to assess your strategy or what do you do well, so what i do now is i i uh, so i meet a lot of very interesting people i do interviews you know how that goes and from time to time i ask someone i said hey can 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 we do like a trade i'll spend two three hours digging into your business sometimes i also just pay right uh, because the other thing i learned is that if it hurts i will pay attention i can only learn when it hurts right mm -hmm. because i'm very quick with stuff very quick so i sometimes need to painfully go for the hurt so i'll pay yeah. somebody for like i mean like you did they're like come in four hours this is my idea this is the plan this is how it's going and then people say yeah, but da, 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 and, it, ah, man, it hurts. and then i move on okay you have okay. to and then, yeah the, 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 and, then, and then if you know move from a sales expert you said 20 percent sales expert 80 percent uh, branding uh, so basically you're pivoting again yeah. How do you make sure that you have it under control? Do you have some type of systems that when you're not there or the things that are the core of your organization yeah. that would well, need to keep on running? So this is interesting. So I think, again, as we're talking very frankly, 
The reason why the sales consulting, I, I always had the issue to scale it because I had lots of investors coming to me saying, Michael, can you please make little Michaels so you can spread because we all need a little Michael, you know, that kind of joke. Yeah. But it was very, so I hired junior consultants. I tried lots of things and it was almost impossible for me because I would show up, they would ask me any question and I kind of would land on my feet. And the classic expert dilemma, right? I would, but it's extremely hard to, um, to scale. Two, you can scale it if you package productize it really clean. Yeah, That's it, nothing else. But as a sales guy, I tend to say yes on many things because I'm there to, right? So for me, it was a really, really difficult to scale the, 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 the sales part. And then it, it, it started really hitting me. It was just, I mean, I would go per week to six, seven customers, completely different businesses. My mind had to switch, was explaining, and you, you kind of start getting... Like brain that is just too much to to, mm -hmm. to follow. Um, so when I started the agency, I cannot film, I cannot edit, I cannot color grade, I can I, most of those stuff. I know how it should look like. I know the techniques and the strategy, but the operational side I cannot, and that's perfect. So I had to hire people, and I had to hire and I manage them and I give a lot of freedom and I control and. And it really, it's, it makes me so happy that I can show up and then they feel, oh, sorry, Michael, uh, we did this. And I'm like, what did you do? Oh, yeah, we finished that, that, that. We talked to the customer. And, I, I, and I, I'm like, why are you unhappy? You did exactly what I wish for. So my next phase for that uh, company is to, um, to also add sales. Not me. That must be intriguing. So for me, I'm letting kind of go of the sales. That's gonna be so. I'm now setting up all the growth marketing, you know, all that stuff. And each, uh, I've never done. I mean, the last four years, all organic, just organic. But I want to push outside because you need to. It's a different pitch, and you need to master it. It's controlling your own destiny. So I now I'm looking into a sales. I'm a bit afraid of not, of course, the operational side because if we sell more, we have some operational issues of being able to follow. And we do very high quality, which takes time. But I think that's gonna be an interesting journey. And it might be that if I scale the sales, I'll go back to my sales site and say, you know what? I figured it out. I hope that's going to happen, right? I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, as you said, productizing, making courses, would you then be thinking in something in, in that sense? Or who would you see? Then? I, I've tried all of that. Huh? So I have the courses. I have all the... No, I'm still thinking of, of like... There, is, there are certain patterns I see in every company. And I think I should find a way to package that better and more. And you know, you got to look for the niche, which is clear, rich, the richness in the niches. But you got to find your niche, and you got to you got to really package it. And and like people come to you and say, okay, I can. Uh, uh, for, I'm just saying something. Uh, for a certain amount, uh, you get very clear. Tack tack tack. And 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 others can do it, not just me. So I'm not looking into the systems of like Tony Robbins that says, well, you can get certified and then you can become a little Tony Robbins. I'm not going to go down the guru route. Uh, I don't think I was very close to starting the whole thing and everything was ready. And then I said, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think so. So, uh, but maybe there is also an age of this setting. I don't believe that when I would be, I'm 45 now. I don't see myself as 55 being the, you know, the honest, I, I, I think there is an age for certain of these things. Just, yeah. It, you know how that, that's weird. I, I went to the bank, I had a, I bought a property and I said, I want to lend it on a certain amount of time. And the bank came back and said, no, we can't do that. And I'm like, what? Yeah, but I have money and yeah, but we cannot do it on the time you request because you're 45. It means you have to pay this within. And I'm like, it's the first time somebody confronted me with the ends, right? <laughs> sure, yeah. I got to do something here. So the yes. clock is ticking, Cedric. I have it really, really strong, but the clock is ticking. And the older yes. I, I get, the worse it becomes. It's like I have the same. I mean, huh? I have the same. I'm a few, a few years older than you. Um, and, and it really is ticking, eh? especially. Eh? With buying property, that is one of the things. Uh, we've said, okay, in five years, I want to be there. In 10 years, I want to be there. Then it's, oh, my age is uh, then. So uh, true, yeah. when it's time to build, when it's time to cruise, when it's time to giving back, it, it, it all has an impact, of course. I, 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 I thought that my energy would, as age progressed, would go down. I don't have that. It's still mm -hmm. going strong. Yeah, neither do I. The yeah. One thing I have 
And my dad, by the way, my dad made me when he was 58. So I have known my dad always when he was in his 60s. He was the same. He was like powering through. Uh, so I'm not worried about that. What I do uh, notice is that I need to stop on time or I sleep badly. That's something I never had. So I know I need to control a little bit my attention span. That's the one thing I need to really be careful with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and you have a lot of things going on. Huh? You, the book, Chaomatic, uh, the, the, the sales expert. So a few, I was always thinking I'm doing this wrong. So a few months ago, I was really thinking I'm doing this wrong. I'm doing too many things at the same time. This is not good. People say focus. And I realized I was listening to, I don't know who, on YouTube something. And suddenly it hit me and I said, hang on. It, it's just my character to do multiple things at the same time. I just cannot do one thing. And actually what I always do is I cross-reference. So I can be reading something about, I mean, nature stuff, like plants that grow. And then I think, oh, that would be a great story. And I love this cross-pollination, everything I do. So I actually stop worrying about it. And I said, okay, I can do two, three things at the same time. Try not to do five, six things at the same time. Two, three things at the same time. Try not to say yes on everything. I still kind of do. Um, but be faster to say it's not going to work, which I used to try and fix it. Now I'm fast. And yeah, it's not going to work. But I, I on purpose actually look for, I realized I am on purpose doing multiple things. And it makes me happy. That's, that's good. So yeah. focus all yeah. fine. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah, true. You have these um, micropreneurs, uh, the people that are running multiple uh, businesses, and they actually say focusing on one thing is bad because if it fails, you put all all your energy in it. While if yeah. you have two, three traje trajectories, you can uh, yeah. you can shift and put yeah. your energy there. And, and the other thing is, whatever you you want to do, it always takes more time than you plan. Oh, definitely. That's yeah, that's definitely. Yeah. that's the scary part, and that's why I came up with the lake of rejection and all of that story is because like I. I want a shortcut, shortcut, and there is no shortcut. You gotta just do the movements. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. When you see plans, eh, in three months I wanna have that revenue, but you just started the business, or yeah. in X amount of time, my reps will be ramped up. So there's yeah. a lot of naivety as well in, in, in the way people yeah. think about systems. Especially when you go to startups, scale ups, when they make business yeah. plans. I don't know where they get all of this, but then, yeah, Michael, you gotta, go, you gotta have the hockey stick, you gotta go for the. Uh, and then, really, I. I, in the big four years ago, I would listen and say, now I say, sorry, but this is complete. I know you've watched, I know which movies you've watched. Forget it. This will never happen because you just don't have the people. You don't have the money. It's going to cost you triple the amount. You think it's like startup. You need software. You need 2 million. Whatever you tell me, I know you're going to need 2 million to ramp it up properly. So how do you get to the 2 million? Because you're going to get, uh, you see? So if you want that, that's the consequence. If you say I have more time, I want to do it. Okay. But the viral effect and all of that, I mean, let's be real, in, in, the, in the hundreds of, of startups, I mean, I only know one that literally exploded. I mean, like in, could really, all the rest was just hard work and it took longer than they wanted. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah I, I need a buffer. Uh, and and yeah, the one that exploded, by the way, got, I think they're almost bankrupt now because they got killed. I can't tell you who, but... It was so much, it wrecked the entire company. They couldn't deliver. They just couldn't deliver. Mm -hmm. And then the pressure came on and just, you, you get imploded. Yeah. 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 So, so I, re I really like the movement of the bootstrap businesses going on. If people are working on the mini businesses, uh, working with agency and product at the same time. So yeah. it, it is in a different way of, uh, of um, uh, looking at things as well. Um, and you just said the hockey stick moment. So. If you look at K-Matic, do, do you have an idea when will your hockey stick moment arrive? Is it your so, ambition? Uh, the moment I don't do sales, that's going to be a dramatic change, literally, because then the machine means I need to have fixed all the things behind to be able to just flow. I, up to this date, I never really pushed the gas down mm -hmm. because we still have some operational issues. I am still learning how much time certain things and in my mind, I might be faster, but sometimes you got to deliver it too much. So we have some operational issues with we need more people hiring, finding the right people. That's slowing me down currently. Um, I'm curious. I think, I mean, it's like growing like this, um, but it's a very people intensive business. So if you have a yeah. software rec recurrent, a friend of mine is selling uh, industrial uh, water pumps. So the guy, every, every pump he sells, he has a main, I mean, I don't have that with this business, right? So, so I'm still thinking about the model and thinking. My, my gut feeling is I, I, 
they say three, four years you need to really, really ramp it up. And if I'm looking at it, I'm actually only doing it for a year, two months with, with, with three people now with all the size. I think it's going to take another few months to really... Because you know what's going to happen then? You have to put better process in place and the processes slow things down. And I'm not always the best process guy because I'm the guy that, you know, I go out, I try crazy stuff and, and then I get in the deals and all that. But really, so probably I'll need somebody more on the operational side kind of structuring some of that. Yeah. I think it, How would you avoid mix. this? Hmm? I mean, you're right, right? Processes slow things down. And that's, for me, the end of many mature companies. Too many overhead, too many processes yeah. set in stone. Especially as a, as a startup or as a small organization, how would you prevent significantly slowing down your organization but still having predictable processes? I think it's it's a bit of a balance. I think one is a bit of leadership to always keep saying we're gonna go there. That's the goal. Sometimes forgive when things kind of go, because yeah, there is also a lot of a lot of people that oops, sorry there is um there is a lot of hiding behind the process also, right? I think it's also a bit in the attitude of the people you hire. And I think a company up to 15 people, you can still have this kind of feeling where you really, but once you go above, you start losing the grip on. And I think that's when the moment when the process starts and when, when people start. And there is always one, of course, that does crazy stuff. So you change all the processes for one person that does something which wasn't supposed to do. Yeah. I'm really afraid of that moment because I know it will happen. It is, it is the case. I'm, I'm kind of very open. I give a lot of freedom. I give a lot of trust. But of course, you got to sometimes control and I mean, do random controls, check. Uh, I, I, I used to be a very different manager when I was running a company. When I was the VP of sales, it was very different, much tougher also. Now I'm nicer in a way. I'm also a bit older. I understand things more. I don't know if I'm a better manager or not. Let's see. Time will prove. Mm -hmm. And is it an organizational issue, you think? Is the uh, people hiring issue? I think it's a mix. It, I think it's a people hiring issue. It's also a, a trick to really like a process thing to cover. And I, you, yeah, 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 there are just... There are people that tip, look at sales. Sales is always bad in filling in CRM. The really good sales, you don't need a CRM. I mean, we can have this endless debate, but I never needed a CRM to do really big deals, right? Because I, I would. And then you have the, the and then you have the, so for, what I find amazing is, a, I, I won't tell you which company, there's a company, they have, uh, they got uh, 20, 25 million, they've been growing, it's a Belgian company, big software, growing, 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 growing. And at a certain stage, they had like over, 80 salespeople. And what they did is they needed a VP of sales. So they asked me to help them a little bit to do some interviews and, uh, uh, and see if they had the right guy. You know what's funny who they hired? They hired a young guy that had no experience in sales, but is extremely good with data. And he turned the business around. I never expected it because I really said, damn, how can you run this? The guy did an amazing job, a truly amazing job. And I'm still thinking, I don't, I, I still, I'm still impressed with it. But I think again, uh, you have like a uh, Sasta website have these explanations of you need a certain VP on a certain stage. It's exactly the guy when I was reading the article, it's exactly that guy that they talk about for the numbers, go bigger again. So when you start a small business, you need people, right? Then you need a process person. Then you need a scale person, which is again, like we're gonna get the money and and I think it's it's like the you know it's never the water is never calm. I've never I'm seen sure. the water calm. There is always something moving somewhere. And if people tell me, yeah, yesterday I was with a good friend. We went to a restaurant. He's like, yeah, my life is good. I've been calm and like very impatient guy. Yeah, I've been so calm and I've been so zen. And I said to him, said, dude, you know, in two weeks you're gonna be like all crazy again. He's like, no, no, no. And I said, trust me, it's just moving all the time. There is no there is no standstill. Yeah, and that's a challenge if you talk about people. Huh? You, people in companies often expect, okay, I want to have my VP sales. I'll be set for five or ten years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, uh, or, or stupid stuff. Huh? You have a guy or a girl who's really good, and then they get a boyfriend. And then suddenly, they come, they come with crazy demands. And, and, and they're like, hang on, what happened to you? Right? But that's their choice of life. And yeah, that's people. That's people. That's people. That's people. And... So, 
people is one. Eh? So yeah. processes then probably will maintain uh, the quality, the, the yeah. quality of service that you deliver. Um, strategy, we spoke about your, your strategy. Do you have other moments? And eh? besides once a month, you're checking in with, with, with somebody or to, to, to um, picking holes inside your plan. Yeah, actually, you have so, all the ways. Yeah. So every three months, I have to uh, fill in the accountancy. And then I get in all the reports and I had it. Uh, so Q1 just passed. So I got all the, the details. And for instance, I realized that I didn't spend enough time on the margins. I kind of did the bottom up price. I said, okay, how much do you want to pay? And I, but I never had, this is typical the agency business, right? I never did the calculation backwards saying, okay, because we got so much work, I had to hire freelancers. And suddenly I saw the pricing of this freelancer and I said, hang on. So now I, every quarter when I get in the numbers and all the stuff, I actually take like half a day and I really try to go through and say, what am I doing? Not just numbers. What am I doing wrong? This is not good. Do we like this? Do we like this type of, who is the biggest customer? I really go through and every single time we kind of change. We don't really pivot, but there is always a change happening. It's like now I said, pricing is not okay. We got to fix something. The way we deal with freelancers, not okay. We got to do this differently. We, we start to learn now only the exact right customer because that's also something that a lot of companies get wrong. It takes them more time than they realize to understand the exact customer. Yesterday, interesting, I was with a company called Epic Base. Epic Base, they have a, a, it's a Belgian company and they have invented something called food recipe management. Imagine, five restaurants, you want all five restaurants to make exact same dish, right? If you're a chain. However, cooks and personal changes. So how do you fix that? So they found a way to fix it and they're growing really nicely. They had some hiccups along the way. And uh, they told me yesterday, I phoned with the CEO because I've been following him for a few years, Kyle. He said to me, well, Michael, it's actually only, to be really honest, four months ago, we figured out the exact, exact buying persona. And since the moment we found it, all hell broke. I mean, in a positive way, we just came. Yeah. And they can literally now, which is, is a, that's the dream scenario, they can calculate if we spend 2,000 euro in that type of ads, we know exactly what's coming out of it. And wow. then he, he went, with that number, he went to collect 16 million, something like that. And, and now it's like a spaceship. But it took him a long time. So I'm pretty sure with my Chaomatic, I haven't, I don't, I kind of know it, but we're not there yet. I spoke mm. yesterday with a startup and they're also in the same. So they said, yeah, or customers or mm, uh, SDRs. Uh, but then in the end, it's different. They're the users, but they're not the customers. It's, it's, there's a huge yeah. difference there as well. We, we did uh, last year uh, with the guys from uh, Growforce, we did uh, the ultimate SDR training, talking about SDRs. We were saying to each other, like, this is weird. We, nobody spends time on SDR. So we did the ultimate SDR training. Five half days of pure goodness from sales to marketing, growth, hacking, everything we could find properly into these days. And we went out in the market and we kind of sold easily six tickets, put a nice price to it. And then we kind of eventually sold 10 tickets. And then we stopped because we said we got to do the training first. And while we were doing it, we realized that the target for this type of training is not SDRs it's actually sales leaders because yeah, it, from a decision point of view, from, a, I mean, the, the SDRs need to have the knowledge, but it's the sales leader that you have to put, make and they see. So it, yeah, you can be completely wrong. Yeah. It, yeah. Best example is on my YouTube. I still call it one of the deep, deep insights I got. So I'm, I, so I'm a sales director, VP of sales, you know how it goes. So I start producing content. What's the biggest problem for a sales director? It's, Closing. My whole life was about forecasting, closing, 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 all very complex models. So I need to make content and I'm going to make five movies in an hour, right? So I write topics down, like how to close, everything around closing. Uh, and then I thought, I got to say something else. So maybe I talk about like presentation. So how do you, how do you keep attention during a presentation? So I launched my five videos and I expected closing, closing, closing. And pricing was also not you know what happened? Most viewed up to date on my YouTube, I think 120,000 views still going really crazy every day, thousand views is the presentation stuff. And the reason for that, it took me a long time to understand this. The reason for that is, although closing is the real problem, 
It's a very sophisticated problem. Sales presentation is an easy, quick fix. It's a shortcut. We, when we produce content, make the real content, but also add some shortcuts because we're all looking for the shortcut. We never have time. And it took me like, so now when we build content machines, we will have all this, the, 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 the right content, but I'll always add, start adding install shortcuts. And it's always the same. It's always, is that that people go for? Yeah, yeah it's fascinating. And it, it's an amazing learning, definitely. And we complex, we make our life so much more complex than it, than it could be, than it should be. And if we bring in and the rest, uh, great yeah. input, great yeah. input. Yeah. And um, if, if you look at the, um, the thing in looking back, yeah. What do you wish that you had before you started? Before, hang on. Before I started what? Before you started your entrepreneurship. Um, as, as everything grew kind of organically, very organically, um, I think I might have, I might have, but this is very technical. I think I still lack a bit of financial knowledge. Funnily enough, I'm really good in deals. I just add margin. So I'm sh yeah. I'm sure that the finances are right, right? But a bit of finance, understanding some of these financial KPIs and a bit more that would have, that would have helped. The other thing I also think, and this might be very weird. So one of the trends I see is that I'm very, I'm a giver. I like to, hey, phone up people, come over. Let me give this to you, right? And I think you sometimes underestimate the power of, of, of the value and the brand and all of that. And I think I should, in the beginning, be a little bit more brave about, no, you want me to do this. It's going to cost you money. So I had a lot of, and I had a girl telling me, she said to me, Michael, because I asked like, eh, what would you do? And she said to me, yeah, Michael, don't underestimate how many people are going to come to you and want something of you. And I think I was very naive. I'm still I'm a bit naive. I think in life you should be a little bit naive, right? But I still think I was very naive. And I think there... And also, this is the really right answer. I made a basic mistake. And I see many companies making a basic mistake. And I hope you don't do it. Which is the following. I am very good in making noise. I'm very good in reach and attention. I'm very good in telling a story. And I'm always looking at new. My whole training for 25 years was business. New, 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 bigger, faster, big, new, new, new. So I'm focused on that. That's my nature. But I forget one stupid thing. The product behind. So again, I do these events. I do these YouTubes and that. But if you would go to my website now, you would say, but hang on. What's the real product? It's going to be hard to find. And I think that's my, it's probably my nature, but it's an endless mistake. I go back and back and back and back. Look to gurus, look to guru training, look to the dot-com secrets, all of that. They do it reversed. They start with the product and then they build. And for some reason, I keep falling into this trap. I think because I just like it, I keep falling into this trap. And I think that's the major biggest one thing that I should have changed. And almost even four years further, I'm still struggling with that. I'm still well, struggling. You, still, you, do, you do talk about the value ladders. All the time. All yeah. the time. But I find it so amazing and so big. And, and for, for, for Kiomatic, it's, it's, it's easy. Yeah? It's B2B content. That's it. You want to scale content? We'll do it for you in a very high qualitative way. If you want a sales consulting, ah, it depends, right? It can be many, many things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because true. it's always content. That, yeah. That's true. Yeah. As you said yourself, aiming the gun. Sales is extremely yeah. broad. You said yeah. SDR, biz dev, uh, you have channel, you have pricing, you name it. You can make yeah. trainings around everything. So yeah. maybe we spoke about the imposter center. Maybe that's another handicap that people with a wide knowledge have. Okay, yeah. what will I choose? In other words, in other words what, what will I stop doing? Maybe yeah. you make the wrong choice. So let's, let's go as wide as possible. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah, I fully agree. And but it's funny how you how bump. You... It's funny how you mm -hmm. always bump through life, always to the same. You, I, I think you have a certain character. You kind of can maneuver it a bit, but certain things always come back. And it's funny how I keep bumping every cycle again into the same thing. And I see it coming from a mile away. Now, yeah, yeah this time I'm going to do it differently. And I. <laughs> 
but straight on back. <laughs> and as time progresses, you kind of either you let go and say, yeah, I did this, I fix it with somebody else, right? Or you, yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm one of those guys that I try, I tried working on the weakness, but then I realized if I, if I just triple down on my strengths, I can go way faster in the weakness. Well, let's, let's see. So, yeah, I, th I think it's a character thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a character uh -huh. thing. Maybe it makes sense to think about uh, having a, a product person. That's the structured person. I always said, always said when I was like uh, five, six years in sales, I always said, if I find my technical counterpart, I'll start building my own software, my product. And actually in those days, it must have been great because there was no startup culture or nothing, right? It, it must have been very interesting to do it in those days. Now I actually bump sometimes into people and we have this chat and I said, uh, but I know what it takes to do build the whole software thing, right? One day I got to do it, but I'm like a little bit worried. So I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to build out the brand. I'm going to do more of that. If I have my content machine, whatever idea I come up with, and I say, okay, now is the moment to go. I have everything ready to just accelerate it and explode it. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. a bit of the, the, the plan eventually in the long run. Uh, as, uh, accidentally, yesterday I read an article that this is the way to go. Build a brand, uh, go agency, and then uh, have yeah. your uh, SaaS. Yeah, uh, it's also very now. Eh? It's very, uh, very uh, now, especially also with the great resignation. Let's look at some market yeah. trends. Not only the great resignation; yeah. it's also going to become. It's going to be the great unhiring, right? How to find people because all of them want to be freelancer. But if you want to build a company, you do need some employees. That so I'm I'm very curious to see what's going to happen. But it's good times. Yeah. Times. Yeah, it's good times, exciting times. I mean, you don't find people any anywhere. It's it's absolutely crazy yeah. anywhere. Uh, and then I heard about the company. So we are now in the, the work from home, return to the office. Yeah. Uh, companies, big companies that make a decision, you have to return to the office because we spend a lot of money on the property. The result will be that they will lose and the people and then the building will be empty anyway. So that's, that's, that's always, yeah. Yeah. I don't fight that anymore. I'm like, okay, yeah. you want to do it? I call it the Tai Chi movement, right? So when it hits you in the face, I used to try and block it. Now I just step aside, I use the energy and I pull them on the floor. I said, that's exactly what you got to do. I think you should do it. And <laughs> it's funny. And then they start thinking, hang on, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> yeah, but it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Great. I have uh, three questions that uh, I ask all the uh, guests. <laughs> So if you look again, and we went already a bit into it, but if you say no, uh, you're sales uh, experts, uh, what do you wish you have done differently? I think I should have started with this product, the product mindset first. So flip it around. Two, I think I should have dared to quickly, more quickly find a more operation, technical person like my, 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 Structured counterpart. I don't forget chaotic stands for K automating chaos, right? So it is chaos, right? So I need the structured counterpart. I think if if I would have pushed there and would have done a bit more, I think I would have been. I mean, from a money point of view, company point of view, I, I think I would have been three steps ahead. That's what mm -hmm. I think. This is very open and honest, right? So don't write articles about this. Huh? <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's only recorded, but uh, and we, we won't talk about it. <laughs> between us and a thousand friends. So. Yep. Yes, yes. Uh, and you're a very avid producer of contents. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, do you have inspirations, podcasts, books that you really uh, help you? Um, I, I, if, you go, if you go sales, uh, I think the guys from Winning by Design are absolutely nailing it. I'm very impressed, not only the way they explain things, but also the visualizing of the. I'm very from pure technical point of view i'm really impressed on many levels so winning by design you can buy the handbooks online really really good i still love all the stuff of russell bronson the dot com secrets kind of things because it explains funnels and it makes me think very very differently for some weird reason it always kind of triggers my brain um to look at things differently and for now i'm just thinking what i'm reading i'm especially reading a lot of marketing because I'm writing the book about uh, attention span and all of that. So I'm reading a lot of stuff into that, but there is nothing yet that has really sparked my... Uh... Yeah. You know what, what's good? If you read something and you say, I wish I would have written this, right? 
So I haven't yet in that. So so the winning by design, yes, there was upon some of that stuff, but I haven't met anything where I thought ah, that's really good. So it's good because I need to write it up. Yeah. Yeah. What I like about Russell Bruns is that he puts his uh, customers on the platform. He does not talk a lot about his product. Yeah. Uh, and he really lets his uh, customers show the success of uh, his product by showing their successes. There is, a, there is a movie, so he got invited by Grant Cardone, which is a bit of a, yeah, well, we all have an opinion there. So he got invited. Ten and time, he, eh? Yeah, yeah. And he, he, he's on stage and he actually has a whole movie and he explains how in half, in half an hour, he sold a million dollars, something like that. And he actually shows the video how he does it. So he's on stage explaining a technique how to do it. And you see people standing up, rolling. And it's really, I'm like, this is just skills, skills, skills. This is really, really good. I mean, whatever he sells, it doesn't matter. But the skill, I'm just impressed with the skill level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, great. And, and the last question for you. So... When is it time to pivot? When somebody decides, okay, either I'm going from an employee to an entrepreneur or my business model doesn't work anymore or I have too much stress, what would be for you the guidance to say, okay, we, we need to pivot? I think the moment the work starts really burning, burning, you're like Friday evening and you're suddenly think, shit, I still need to make invoices and Saturday. And, and when that starts pushing, you've got to start changing. You've got to start outsourcing pieces and maybe you start small with like upwork kind of stuff or first PA or, but you, that's the one Two, the moment I woke up and I thought it's no more fun. I have to do this. And it was just too much. And I know sometimes you have big pressure moments, but it was just too much. And I thought this is not going to work. So that's for me, the moment to pivot and I can have it even, I can have it on my own. Then I started adding people. And then even with five, six people like we now, we sometimes have that moment where I, I have all this stuff coming at me and I'm like, no, 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 no. So we either have to add somebody or maybe we got to replace somebody or whatever uh, reason. And then the other, the last one, which is, I mean, I, it sounds so bad, but the, the last four years, I had a lot of fun making this stuff. I really like making content. And I realized that That's clear. if I do stuff I like, I can keep it up. That's it. Right, as simple as that. So sometimes you get bored. You do so. I had a YouTube show. I did 120 episodes of sales acceleration. I just got bored. I mean, I, I didn't find interest. So I stopped for two years. Now, and by the way, you're you're going to be one of my guests. I'm going to go back at it, but I'm going to do it very differently. Right? I'm going to add more fun, more craziness. Try to be more me. You know, I like the, the mm -hmm. stupid jokes. I just like the stuff, and I think that will make it worthwhile. It's still a lot of work. It's always work. It's always okay. work. Yeah. I don't believe in the free, no, it's always work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, true. I got the love that you do. Thank you. And we have seen actually also uh, in this talk a different Michael, uh, <laughs> yeah. a, bit, uh, a bit calm, a bit quiet, not as crazy as you can be. Um, you you're very why? open. I spent uh, the last four days on stages explaining like crazy. So you've seen me really calm I've because seen, I'm just yeah. tired. <laughs> Okay, okay. So I have my, I'm, yeah, watching, no, so... I'm watching now in the corner is a bottle of red wine. So after this podcast, I'm going to have one glass. I think, oh. <laughs> you deserve it. Which one, uh, which bottle is it? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a Spanish one. It's, uh, it's, um, it's Spanish red. It's, uh, how do you call it? Because I always say Duro, but you have the, the river, you know, that goes. Ribera del Duero. Yeah. It's one, and then the Rioja is the other. Yeah. yeah. The... It's the well, Ribera del Duero. There the Rivera, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm very it's curious. It's such it can a be good very game, yeah. powerful, so I'm very curious. Very good. And even the younger Ribera del Duero can taste very rich, so yeah. it's absolutely yeah. very good price quality. Bottle. I got yeah. the bottle uh, today because I was teaching in uh, high school and all these students of, uh, they gave me yeah. a bottle, so I said, okay, that's, that's, that's always give something back and always yeah, settle the score yeah. always yes, <laughs> true. you will enjoy the bottle trust me and thank you very much you have been very open uh very transparent on your business your decisions uh your next steps really appreciate it and i wish you all the best with your book kmatic and then the other projects that are uh, undoubtedly coming thank you Sidek. catch you next time you're a guest on one of my future so shows so you're always welcome in Belgium. thank you very much Bye. See you. Bye-bye.